first words I wrote, which some of you may recognize, were, when I think of the farm, I think of mud. I'm going to read that passage to you now. It's narrated by Laura, the considerably less cheerful and more rebellious character that my grandmother evolved into over the course of writing the book. So this is Laura. When I think of the farm, I think of mud. Limbing my husband's fingernails and encrusting the children's knees and hair. Sucking at my feet like a greedy newborn on the breast. Marching in boot-shaped patches across the plank floors of the house. There was no defeat in it. The mud coated everything. I dreamed in brown. <laughs> when it rained, as it often did, the yard turned into a thick gumbo with the house floating in it like a soggy cracker. When the rains came hard, the river rose and swallowed the bridge that was the only way across. The world was on the other side of that bridge, the world of light bulbs and paved roads and shirts that stayed white. When the river rose, the world was lost to us and we to it. One day slid into the next. My hands did what was necessary, pumping, churning, scouring, scraping, and cooking, always cooking, snapping beans in the necks of chickens, kneading dough, shucking corn, and digging the eyes out of potatoes. No sooner was breakfast over and the mess cleaned up than it was time to start on dinner. After dinner came supper, then breakfast again the next morning. Get up at first light, go to the outhouse, do your business, shivering in the winter, sweating in the summer, breathing through your mouth year round. Steal the eggs from under the hens, haul in wood from the pile and light the stove. Make the biscuits, slice the bacon, and fry it up with the eggs and grits. Rouse your daughters from their bed, brush their teeth, guide arms into sleeves and feet into socks and boots. Take your youngest out to the porch and hold her up so she can clang the bell that will summon your husband from the fields and wake his hateful father in the lean-to next door. Feed them all in yourself. Scrub the iron skillet, the children's faces, the mud off the floor was day after day while the old man sits and watches. He is always on you. You better stir them greens, gal. You better sweep that floor now. Better teach them brats some manners, wash them clothes, feed them chickens, fetch me my cane. His voice clotted from smoking, his sly, pale eyes with their hard black centers on you. He scared the children, especially my youngest, who was a little chubby. Come here, little piglet, he'd say to her. She peered at him from behind my legs, at his long yellow teeth, at his bony yellow fingers with their thick curved nails like pieces of ancient horn. Come here and sit on my lap. He had no interest in holding her or any other child. He just liked knowing she was afraid of him. When she wouldn't come, he told her she was too fat to sit on his lap anyway. She might break his bones. She started to cry, and I imagined that old man in his coffin. Pictured the lid closing on his face, the box being lowered into the hole. Heard the dirt striking the wood. Pappy, I said, smiling sweetly at him, how about a nice cup of coffee? But I must start at the beginning, if I can find it. Beginnings are elusive things. Just when you think you have hold of one, you look back and see another earlier beginning and an earlier one before that. Even if you start with chapter one, I am born, you still have the problem of antecedents, of cause and effect. Why is young David fatherless? Because, Dickens tells us, his father died of a delicate constitution. Yes, but where did this mortal delicacy come from? Dickens doesn't say, so we're left to speculate. A congenital defect, perhaps, inherited from his mother, whose own mother had married beneath her to spite her cruel father, who'd been beaten as a child by a nursemaid who was forced into service when her faithless husband abandoned her for a woman he chanced to meet when his carriage wheel broke in front of the milliner's where she'd gone to have her hat trimmed. If we begin there, young David is fatherless because his great-great-grandfather's nursemaid's husband's future mistress's hat needed adornment. <laughs> By the same logic, my father-in-law was murdered because I was born plain rather than pretty. That's one possible beginning. There are others. Because Henry saved Jamie from drowning in the great Mississippi flood in 1927. Because Pappy sold the land that should have been Henry's. 
because Jamie flew too many bombing missions in the war, because a Negro named Ronsel Jackson shone too brightly, because a man neglected his wife and a father betrayed his son and a mother exacted vengeance. I suppose the beginning depends on who's telling the story. No doubt the others would start somewhere different, but they'd still wind up at the same place in the end. It's tempting to believe that what happened on the farm was inevitable, that in fact all the events of our lives are as predetermined as the moves in a game of tic-tac-toe. Start in the middle square, no one wins. Start in one of the corners and the game is yours. And if you don't start, if you let the other person start, you lose. Simple as that. The truth isn't so simple. Death may be inevitable, but love is not. Love, you have to choose. I'll begin with that, with love. That's a bit of Laura. Thank you.